Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. Let's go ahead and get started because we got we got a lot of ground to cover today. It's getting ready to be on and pop. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll start. We will begin our discourse into Revelation chapter 17, verses 9 through 11. Lord, thank you uh, so much just for this opportunity that we have uh, to be here, to be present, and to learn from you um, by your text. Pray, God, that this would be an informative uh, teaching, that this would be instructive, um, and that we would be amazed at uh, just uh, all the history, the philosophy, all the things, Lord, that are involved with uh, with your word. Thank you, Lord, so much uh, just for this opportunity. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about and uh, kind of get us up to speed on what we talked about last week, and then we will jump into our issue for um, for today. Um, last week we had discussed uh, the seven mountains, the seven horns. I'm sorry, um, that are found in verse nine through eleven. It says, here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains <clears throat> on which the woman sits. <clears throat> and they are five, there, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. We talked about the five kings and spent a lot and spent the whole time talking about who these kings were. First of all, it wasn't focused on the kingdoms or the empires. We looked at that word and although it is related um, it is not the same word that is used to describe particular kingdoms, but specifically kings themselves. Okay? Now, these kings may be associated with these particular empires, but nevertheless, the phrase that is used is kings, Basileus, and not kingdoms, Basilea, right? And I had mentioned that um, these kings specifically were related to Babylon. OK, um, uh, uh, the, 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 not just the region, but the city itself. That's very important, as we'll underscore this this morning. Okay. Then we outlined uh, what I believe to be who the five heads or the five kings were that is being discussed by this messenger. Um, the first one is Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the second one is Nabonidus. Now, Nabonidus is not mentioned in scripture. However, Belshazzar, who is his vice regent, is, as we found out in the book of Daniel. Okay. Dan, uh, Belshazzar was the vice regent of Babylon under Nabonidus. Okay. The third king uh, was Cyrus. Okay. Same thing with the fourth king. Ashuharis is the ruler of uh, this particular uh, time period between 485 and 465 BC. And yet Darius the Mede is the vice regent of Ashuharis, which we saw also in Daniel. Okay, So he makes up uh, the fourth head here. And then the fifth one is uh, Seleucius I Nicator, which is a successor to Alexander the Great. Now, I did not know this at the time, but Alexander the Great was buried in Babylon. I had no idea until a couple of days ago. <laughs> so um, Seleucius I Nicator was a successor to Alexander the Great. Alexander died and was buried. And then uh, Seleucius I took over the region of, of, uh, and the city of Babylon. Okay? As a matter of fact, Alexander the Great loved Babylon. He loved him some Babylon. He made it, as a matter of fact, his capital um, when he ruled at the time. So um, we looked at Egypt, too, was mentioned as one of the kingdoms, um, but I had uh, contended that this was less likely for several reasons. Um, Egypt um, never obtained or ruled over Babylon despite being a powerful <laughs> kingdom. Now, it did extend out to there, but, the, but they never ruled over it, so to speak. It was still kind of a land at the time. Uh, the kingdoms mentioned had more real estate uh, than Egypt did. Um, that is uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and all of them. And then uh, Egypt does not figure prominently with the prophecies concerned with Jeremiah, Daniel. Um, as a matter of fact, um, especially in Daniel, we read about the 
one, uh, the conqueror or the one to come, that the king who does, that does as he pleases will actually rule over Egypt. Okay. But I, I can be persuaded, though. Um, there's some very compelling cases out there. But I still believe that uh, when it's talking about the five kingdoms, it's referencing essentially Nebuchadnezzar as the first one. Okay, let's go to Revelation, again, chapter 17, verses 9 to 10, and then we will look at some commentators, and then we will walk through this. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are the seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain for a little while. There are uh, several commentators who uh, uh, talk about this particular uh, area of scripture. The, the one is, specifically. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of them. Um, this is Adam Clark um, commenting on this particular uh, area of scripture. He writes this, when speaking to St. John, that the one is, that is the sixth head, or a Latin form of government, was then in existence, which could be of no other than the imperial power, this being the only independent form of Latin government in the apostolic age. It therefore necessarily follows that the Roman forms of government by which the Latium was ruled must be the remaining heads of the beast. So he's discussing again the, the form of government that Rome had at the time. He concludes that that is the one who is, according to Revelation 17. John Gill mentions uh, something similar, but um, he goes kind of a different direction. He says, and one is the pagan emperors, a heathen emperor, Domitian, then reigning when John had this vision. And these continued to the opening of the sixth seal, which put an end to that succession as pagan until the woman brought forth the man child or until Constantine's time. So John Gill mentions that uh, the one who is, is not necessarily the form of government, but Domitian, who was reigning at the time in the, um, in the Roman Empire. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, this, this is uh, more, more than likely the popular view. Um, F.B. Meyer writes this concerning uh, the one who is the scarlet attired woman um, is that miserable attempt in every age to counterfeit the true church of the living God. Man does not like the religion of the cross, a faith of self-denial, and each age has witnessed some false system from which all these objectionable elements are eliminated. Surely a, mer um, a meticulous system has revealed itself successively in Babylon, Jerusalem, Rome, London, New York, and other great centers. Fashion smiles upon it, wealth uh, bedizens it, uh, human power unites with it, and in every age it has been drunken with the blood of the martyrs. So he uh, attributes, um, F.B. Meyer attributes uh, the prostitute, the harlot, to essentially the, the counterfeit church. And uh, all of these mountains are areas in which this counterfeit church is affected. Rome, Jerusalem, London, Babylon is even in there. Um, and so that's his take. Um, Donald Fleming writes this concerning the one who is. First century Rome, with its advanced civilization and organized opposition to God, was a clear expression of the anti-God spirit symbolized by the beast, the prostitute in Babylon. The seven heads of the beast explained as representing the seven hills and seven rulers symbolized strength and the stability of Rome. But in any age or society, as people's sense of collective self-sufficiency increases, they inevitably set themselves against God. So he's not just talking about uh, Donald Fleming is not just talking about the region or the or, uh, of Rome or the empire of Rome, but the, the, the attitude, too. So here are our options. The Latin form of government expressed through the Roman Empire, the Emperor Domitian, or the Roman government until the time of Constantine. Um, that's when uh, the one is, was, 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 uh, kind of fulfilled when Constantine, uh, uh, before Constantine, actually. Uh, counterfeit Christianity that has attacked the saints in first century Rome. Okay. 
most of these, uh, most of the commentators, so I looked at more than just these, but most of them are either a, a, a repetition of one of these or a, a kind of an expression of one of these four. And all, all roads lead to Rome. Well, let's take a look at uh, the words that are used themselves. Ace is the word, the one is, or the one who is, right? This is an adjective or a descriptor. This is singular. So we have the number here being underscored as one. The one is. Of course, you have the definite article here at the beginning. Okay. Ha ace esten, right? That's not really the issue. The issue is this word here, esten. Uh, the mood is in the, or the tense is in the present. The mood is in the dictative. It's a statement of fact. The, the person is in the third person, and this is also singular. And of course, this verb is associated with the adjective, ace. So the, the one who is, is this talking about Domitian? Is this talking about the Roman Empire? Is this talking about someone else? Is this even in the present, like as present time? Does it extend out to this time? <laughs> What exactly are we talking about here? This word is in the present active indicative third person, this particular Greek word to be. It occurs 472 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, So we're going to do something here. We're going to go through uh, uh, several verses, and we're going to kind of take a look at the usage of this word. Now, it could be that this word is used in a kind of a future, future sense. So this is a prophecy concerning the future, as the messenger is mentioning to John. But the is could be used as a future is far, far down the line. Right. So after John has died and and this is becomes something later on. Right. Perhaps maybe a future empire or something else down the road. In order for us to kind of pick this apart, we have to look at some of the usages of this. We will be looking at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. The word is used in the Septuagint. Now, I know the Septuagint is not inspired. I get that. But it does help to see how uh, kind of the translators from the, Greek, from the Hebrew text wrote this in the Greek and some of the words that they used. Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. Concerning Abraham and the cut and the, and the circumcision. And every male among you who is of eight days old shall be circumcised throughout the generations. A servant who was born in the house or was brought with money from any foreigner who is not one of your descendants. That is the second one or the third one, I'm sorry. That's not one of your descendants. That's the word Esten that's used in Revelation 17. So God telling essentially Abraham uh, that every male among you who is eight days old is, is, is to be circumcised, right, throughout your generation. So every uh, the, 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 the men right now that are with you and everyone that comes after you, right, and a servant who was born in the house who was bought with for money from any foreigner who is not one of your descendants. So even specifying that a foreigner um, um, is is not to be is to be circumcised too who's not one of your kin in isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 we uh see the same word here esten used in the septuagint it says for thus says the lord who created the heavens he is the god who formed the earth and made it and established it and did not create it it was a waste of place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. That word is none else, or is, is esten. So uh, uh, it's translated like this to show the exclusivity of God himself. There is no other God, period. He is the Lord, and there is none else. 
In Isaiah 64, verses 7 and 8, Let me go ahead and turn there. Isaiah 64, verses 7 and 8. It says, uh, There is no one who calls on your name who arouses himself and take hold of you, for you have hidden from your face from us and have delivered us into your hand into the power of our iniquities but now O lord you are our father we are the clay and you are the potter and all of us are the work of your hand again the phrase there is no one who calls on your name is that usage of the word esten um, in the septuagint so we see the exclusivity of the usage of the word is we see that it is a descriptor right and uh, Isaiah's uh, talking uh, talk about there's, there's no one who calls on your name. It's speaking to the nation of Israel, right? Pointing that out and making that clear. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 14. We read this that every man is stupid you gotta like that devoid of knowledge every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols for molten images are deceitful and there is no breath in them the word is no breath in them that word is esten again referring to that these idols are devoid of life itself they can't talk they don't act they don't respond Right. And then the last one from uh, the Old Testament, Amos, chapter five, verses one to two. It says here, this uh, word, which I will take up for you as a dirge, a funeral procession. O house of Israel, she is fallen. She will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up talking about essentially the, the, the destruction and the waste of Israel when it is invaded. So we find that this word, especially within the prophecies, I looked within the prophecies and even within the prophets themselves and their usage, that it, the word esten is always used in either of these contexts, the exclusivity of a group or a certain type of individual um, uh, to, to, to focus on a particular group of people, such as Israel or uh, some other group um, or a nation. Um, but it's not used in terms of like a future uh, type uh, uh, word itself in the prophets. So what about in uh, the uh, Greek scriptures? As in the first word, uh, the first usage of this word occurs in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24. Okay. Now we go to the Greek scriptures in the book of Matthew. And uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, speaking of the disciples and their instructions. So I'll start at verse 23. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through these cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. The disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. Right? Again, Jesus tell, teaching the twelve, instructing them that uh, a disciple is not above his teacher. Again, bringing out the exclusivity of this teacher and disciple relationship when he's teaching the uh, the the, uh, the disciples. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 25 to 26, concerning the Syrophoenician uh, woman, it says, but she came uh, and began to bow down before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Jesus using a, uh, a, a statement of fact 
right? Concerning, it's not good to take our children's bread and feed it to the dogs. Don't give uh, what's good to them, right? Uh, to, to the dogs, you don't do that, right? We will actually talk about that verse uh, uh, in Mark when we get to, uh, when we talk about that. It's a wonderful passage. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 says he presented a parable to them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which man took and sowed in his field so this is used in a in a, in a, in a, in a most of like in a comparative sense the kingdom of god is like a mustard seed not it is a mustard seed but it is like one um oftentimes jesus did this when he <clears throat> talked about the kingdom of god in uses of parables in john chapter 8 Verse 54, we read, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Jesus uses Esten to talk about who glorifies him, the exclusivity of the Father. It is his Father who glorifies him. And then last, the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 2, discussing Paul and the apostle, uh, not the Paul, being sent out and basically meeting the disciples of John, who missed the whole thing, missed uh, the, 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 appear, the, the coming of Jesus, the, the death, burial, resurrection, they missed it all, right? The ascension, um, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. Paul says, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not. We've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, right? That word is, is Esther. So we see this usage in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew scriptures. We see it in the Greek scriptures, right? This is always speaking of a present tense, third person. It's talking about someone else, right? But it's also used in the book of Revelation five times. Um, including this verse that we're looking at here. Matter of fact, we've already seen this before. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. Uh, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss will go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see this beast. Again, the is not um, is Esther. Again, uh, talking about the beast and some of the qualities and characteristics. In John chapter, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 11, the same word is used here. The beast, which, the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. Um, and he goes to destruction talking about the beast um, in his nature. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, the woman you, who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth, used as a descriptor, right? That the woman that, uh, uh, that John is seeing is the great city, Babylon itself. By the way, which was a title of Babylon at the time, they called it that. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, then I saw a, a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. There was sea, now there isn't, right? It highlights a description or a characteristic of the new heavens and new earth. In this case, there is no sea. So what can we conclude? The word Esten does not seem to be used in a future sense. Now, we could have looked at whole, a whole 472 of them, but uh, I, don't, I don't think you want to do that. Um, it seems like from what I gathered from the usage of Esten and looking at some of where the word is used in its context, it is, all, it is always used to discuss something current or pointing out something else among other things, or referring to something 
or as something else. For instance, the woman is Babylon, right? Describing what these things are, okay? It is never used uh, in terms of uh, looking at something uh, uh, future um, um, in terms of its aspect, but it's always present use and it's referring to something or something else or pointing out something explicitly. Uh, this perspective, we also have to note is John, this is not necessarily John's perspective. This is the messenger's perspective that John is detailing. Okay? The messenger is telling John what this is, what this is. Okay? And John is detailing this. He's writing all this down, okay? So that those who read it would know what he is telling, what the messenger is telling John. Okay. So now that we got this out of the way, it would appear that this is, is a present tense. It, it, it is talking about the time in which John is present tense. The woman in Revelation 17 is Babylon. That's clear. The woman is associated with the seven mountains. That's clear. The seven mountains are referred to seven kings. That's clear from the text. And some are convinced, remember, that this is the Roman Empire, as we saw some of the commentators, both last week and this week. Okay. Now, let me tell you something. The Roman Empire, although vast and expansive, did not have control. Uh, well, let me rephrase this. They did not have control over Babylon as a city. They did have control over the region. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. This was Babylon and the Roman Empire. So you have the Roman Empire here first to third century, and then we have this empire here, the Parthian Empire. Now, I, I had never heard of this empire until I started studying this. <clears throat> Notice where Babylon is. The Roman Empire does not hold it. It seems like there's a, an empire that we've missed, or at least historically we have not seen. Let's take a look at the history of the Parthian Empire. The Parthians ruled from 247 BC to 224 AD. It's a long time. This empire stretched in the West to India and China, all the way to China in the East, okay? Parthia began with Seleucius I. Remember Seleucius I was the, was the successor to Alexander the Great who took Mesopotamia and other places that belonged to Persia, which began what was known as the Seleucid Empire. Okay. And they adopted Greek culture. Um, that's obvious because of Alexander the Great. But they also adopted a Persian form of government, which came from the north of Syria and other places, Persia. Okay. So they were their own empire, all their own, Okay, that ruled for a long time. They were even there, even beyond, even when uh, the Roman Empire seized the land of Babylon. They remained there uh, for about a hundred, uh, about a hundred years more. Okay. The ruler at this particular time was a gentleman by the name of Pacorus II. Okay, Pacorus II was the ruler of the Parthian Empire. He was uh, uh, a ruler uh, um, uh, 70 AD 70 to 115, 116. Okay? Keep that in mind, especially this time. So he would be around at the time of John. He was also the son of the Parthian king, Bologases, which rules was from 51 to, to 78 AD. Okay, and, and then he passed away, and then uh, uh, he took over in his place. 
During the last year of um, of V's reign, Pacorius became a vice regent. So, um, as Vologases uh, Bo, uh, um, was dying, he became a vice regent in place of Vologases. Okay, and then when Vologases died, the kingdom was passed on to Pacorus. Um, he sought trade that spanned through East India or Asia, India, and the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. Um, again, so he was uh, responsible for building trade routes uh, between uh, the Indies and China um, and India and all of those things all the way to the Middle East, okay. which is why the kingdom lasted as well as it, as long as it did because of all of, of the uh, relations between the Middle East and the East itself. Um, he had coinage fashioning him uh, uh, with the diadem, and the coin followed his rule. So the older he got, the coin, the mint changed. So you could see this uh, through his, uh, his, uh, his reign. So as he got older, the mint would change with his, with his face, and we'll see that in a second. On the back of the coin, that was the front of the coin, was his, was his image. On the back of his coin uh, was a picture <clears throat> of the Iranian goddess who was basically giving him the authority to rule. So here is uh, Mr. Pecoris's face um, on the coin. This is when he first began his rule. And then this was the back of the coin uh, where this goddess is basically handing him his authority while he's sitting on the throne. And then here is where he's an older guy. He's got the curly hair going on here and the beard okay this is Pecorus too now Rome did not seize control of Babylon until 117 AD so think about this Pecorus is dead okay he is gone okay as a matter of fact uh it says Babylon, the area or region of Babylon, came under Roman rule as a result of the Second Mesopotamia campaign in CE 116. Whoops. Okay. When an invasion flotilla sailed down the Euphrates to conquer essentially lower Mesopotamia, as a matter of fact, uh, history goes that they they walked in to they they came to lower Mesopotamia. They 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 conquered that they they, they just kind of they just kind of took the lands over. They didn't really battle it at all. Okay? It's really kind of interesting, especially when they got to Babylon. Here is the uh, Roman Empire, and they came into Mesopotamia, conquered that, and then you have uh, Babylon here along this region here. Okay. Now it's fan, now it's interesting to note that the uh, the emperor uh, his name was Trajan or Trajan whatever however you want to spell T R A J A N he's the emperor at the time okay and he heard about Babylon's glory okay and he wanted to kind of uh, go and pay homage to Alexander the Great who was built was was buried there and so he goes and visits because he heard about the the wonderful uh, 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 walls and the ziggurat that was there that was huge and uh, he heard about the hanging gardens and he wanted to go and see the glory that was babylon itself the emperor trajan he goes there to uh babylon to see this city and basically maybe even make it his capital and to lo and behold to his surprise, when he got there, there was nothing there. Trajan ascertained this is in Babylon. So he had taken a side trip there on the basis of reports unmerited by aught that what he saw, which was merely mounds and stones and ruins. When he got there, he was like, where is everything? There's nothing here but just rocks and ruins and stones and Things like that. And for the sake of Alexander, to whom spirit he offered sacrifice in the room where he had died. Okay. Also, 
Expectations were beyond reality. The beautiful, the beauty of Babylon, both imaginary and real, celebrated by ancient creators, was long gone. Its place was taken by ruins of a dubious glory. So that, the, the glory of Babylon didn't exist when he got there. It was gone. So you could say that the Roman Empire did have control of the area of Babylon, but the city wasn't there. That's fascinating. Now, what about the Ottoman Empire? There have been some beliefs that perhaps the one is is talking about the Ottoman Empire. Well, remember, we're talking about kings, not kingdoms. Right now, there's no make, make no mistake. The Ottoman Empire was vast. It was a vast empire, stretched all the way down uh, from here uh, down to Africa, some parts here. Um, uh, Turkey was the central hub and focus. It was vast for sure. But the rise of the empire didn't happen until about 1300 to 1922. That was the, that was the, the the extent of its reign and rule. It was involved in many wars. And the Ottoman Empire did rule over Babylon. But as you recall, there's no city there. Remember that the, the context of the passage in Revelation 17 is about the city, the great city that one ruled over. That city was not there by the time the Ottomans took over. And as I mentioned before, the Ottoman Empire <clears throat> Is it's not about the kingdom, but the kings that ruled over this great city, not necessarily the region, but the city itself. Okay. So from the usage of the language, it would appear that the messenger is discussing the present king that rules over Babylon, that is the city at that time. It is not talking about a future king. Um, it's not talking about the Roman Empire. Although the Roman Empire was vast and significant, the Roman Empire did not rule over Babylon during the time of this writing. I would say, I would, I would presume so, based upon the history of John, the, the time that he's writing, things of that nature. Now, this makes more sense to me, based upon the details of the text, not just Revelation 17, but looking at the whole swath of scripture. For example, it connects us back to the prophecy found in Daniel chapter 11. In Daniel chapter 11, verses three and four, we read that a mighty king will arise and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. This is, the, uh, this is Alexander the Great. But as soon as he's arisen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out towards the four points on the compass, though not to his own descendants, nor according to the authority which he wielded, for his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides them. This connects back to one of the generals, Seleucius, who ruled over Babylon. We know that Babylon existed because Alexander the Great was died and was buried there. We know that Seleucius uh, was given this land, parceled out to him. Okay? So this connects us back to the history of the prophecy found in Daniel, for one. It is also associated with the apostolic writings, the writings of Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, at the end of his letter, it says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Peter writes being in that region and ministering there as well. There's no language that informs the reader that one needs to take Babylon figuratively or spiritually. This is compared in Revelation chapter uh, 11, verse 18. If Peter, or Peter, if John wanted us to take this figuratively, he would have said so, just like he did 
in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, that's the term there, pneumatikos, is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. John writes about the two witnesses and where they died, right? And, and where they were and where they were located. The great city, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. He uses the word spiritually in this text. It's not Sodom and Egypt, but it's spiritually called that because of the idolatry that's there and the hostility, things like that. So Babylon is to be taken in a normal sense, not in some spiritual esoteric sense. If all of the kings are discussing their association or influence over Babylon, that is the great city, and this aspect is present, then this could be, this is, this is the only option, folks. That we're not talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking about the Parthian Empire, specifically the city of Babylon, which is located in that area. This is the only option. It would seem that there was also suffering happening, happening against the Jewish believers, not just in Rome, but in Babylon also. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 8 to 9, we read, Therefore I exhort the elders among you all as a fellow elder and witnesses of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that is also to be revealed. We skip down to chapter 8, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in, in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world, all over the place. So it would appear that there's even some suffering going on in this region as well. Okay. I know I threw a lot out here this morning to think about. I would say... This is kind of a new thought, so you're free to poke holes in it if you'd like. But based on the context of the passage and some of the language, it would seem that the one who is or the one is is not discussing the Roman Empire because they didn't have control over the region itself, but not even in control of the city, but Pacorus II, um, who is the ruler of Babylon during the time of John. That is my thesis. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will uh, we will close for this hour. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your text. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of this text, that um, we could come to it and read it, ponder it, meditate on it and glean from the knowledge that you've given to us. I pray, God, that this would um, continue, Lord, to strengthen and to encourage the believers to, so, to buttress them and that uh, overall you would be glorified. Lord, we thank you so much for it. It's in your son's name. Amen.